Welcome to the Known Victory Church YouTube channel. We are so glad that you found us today. We exist to make Jesus known and to be a place that anyone can call home. If you haven't yet, make sure to subscribe, like, and share these messages so we can truly make Jesus known in our homes, cities, and across the world. We pray that this message impacts you and helps you to grow closer to Jesus. But I'm excited uh, today, uh, as always, uh, to be able to share uh, and, and speak some of the things that God has placed onto my heart. And just want to welcome you again to Known, Known Victory Church. It's an honor to have you here with us today. Those of us who haven't been in a while, those of us who are new, just want to, excited you're here. I'm so excited. Every time I see faces I haven't seen in a while, I get so excited just to see you. But uh, and I'm, I'm, we're praying that you're having a, a fun and restful summer. The thing that blows my mind is we're like already halfway done. And I find like summer, like winter seems to go on forever, but summer seems to go so fast. You know what I'm talking about? It's like February feels like six months sometimes. And then summer, it's like we're already halfway done summer. It's like it's already starting to get kind of cold in the mornings. I'm like, I'm not ready, you know. But uh, we're, we're going to be continuing our series today, uh, Summer Playlist. And we've been sharing and preaching through some of our favorite verses as a church as you've sent them my way. If you haven't yet, you still can feel free. Send me your favorite verse. You can text me or send me a Facebook message or email me or just come talk to me. And uh, let me know some of the verses maybe that you want us to share uh, this summer. But this morning we're going to be uh, talking about, it's actually uh, a few different verses today. It's actually uh, like a, a clump of verses we're going to be going through today. Um, and, and it's an excerpt from one of the greatest sermons, not one of the, it is the greatest, in my opinion, greatest sermon ever praised that Jesus spoke in Matthew chapter 5 that we call the Sermon on the Mount. And there's so much in, the, in Matthew chapter 5 and 6 and 7 that are just like absolutely incredible uh, thoughts and incredible things that we can learn and encouragements to us and, and things that can help us just grow closer to him. And these are the words that he spoke to us. And so we're going to be going through uh, four of these verses today. And so we're going to be Matthew chapter 5, verse 13 through 16. So if you have your Bible, you can turn with me uh, to Matthew chapter 5, uh, verse 13. And this is when Jesus is talking about the salt and the light. And so it says in chapter 13, it says, You are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. He says, You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket. But on a stand is it gives light to all the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. And so as we look at this, really what Jesus is sharing is he's preaching this incredibly powerful sermon. What he's saying here early is he's telling us really what our role is, what our responsibility is in our world and in our culture. What are we supposed to do about everything happening around us? How, what are we supposed to do when culture seems to be shifting and, and moving and transforming? And, and have you noticed our culture is shifting and changing rapidly? The things that used to be are now not anymore and the things that we thought never would be are now what they are. And so we're seeing this culture shift. And really, in, this is Jesus telling us, this is what to do in the world. This is what you are supposed to be like when you go to work. This is what you're supposed to do when you go into the world, when you are come face to face with culture. What are we supposed to do? And he's telling us here that we have power. But he's also telling us that we have a choice in what we do. Right, he, He's telling us that this is what you're supposed to do, but if you don't do it, some things might happen. Some things might shift. Some things might not actually take place that are supposed to happen. Because he says not to lose our saltiness. Why? Because if we do, basically everything we do is useless. You know, it says to be thrown and out and trampled upon. And so I'm like, I don't want to lose my saltiness because I don't want to be trampled on. Like, I don't want to be just thrown away. I actually want to have an impact. I want to actually have influence in our world. I actually want to be able to, to share Jesus with people and share the gospel with people. And I've, if you've noticed this in the world, uh, and maybe in your family or even at work, people don't care as much about what you say, but they care more about what you do. Have you ever had someone tell you that they're going to show up on time and then, they don't. 
See, actions speak pretty loudly. I think we know, you know, we can say, yes, I, I know I'm the light of the world, but are we actually acting it out? I think it's sometimes it's easy for us to share the gospel, but I think for some of us, it's harder to live it out. It's hard for us to actually live out what Jesus has called us to do as we follow him to actually live out the things that we have to do. And I think I've learned and I continuously learn that just because I say something doesn't mean it's actually going to happen. Like, I actually have to put action to it. I know so many times, I'm like, Beth, I'm going to do the dishes before I go to bed. And then I wake up, and I'm about to leave for work, and I look at the counter, all dishes there. I didn't even clean one. Actually, I made more dishes. And I'm like, ah, yeah, see, I I can say I'm going to do it, but am I actually going to do what I say I'm going to do? And really, this is Jesus telling us, we got to take action We can't just say the things. We actually got to live it out. We actually got to be the salt and we got to be the light in the world. And so we have kind of two points, two thoughts today that I want to share with us. And number one is we got to be the salt, right? It's not complicated. Let's be the salt. Now, I don't know if you know somebody who loves salt, like in like a kind of like odd way. I remember we used to cook for my grandfather and we go to his house and we cook him a meal and I'm, I, I wish I was being sarcastic. He would hold the salt shaker over his food for five, five to ten seconds. Just hold it. And it would be pouring out. And, and I don't know what kind of technology salt shakers this man had, but it was like a faucet. It was like onto his plate. Like my salt shakers are kind of slow. You got to shake it. He would just like hold it, and it would just pour out onto his plate for like five to ten seconds. And I would watch in awe being like, like, like are you okay? You know what I mean? Like, like, like. Why do you need so much salt? But it's, if we know about salt, salt has this really powerful way of making food just taste better. And now, I consider myself to be a pretty good cook, I'll be honest. Like, like I'm pretty good at cooking. I don't do it a lot because I, I don't want people to feel like, like jealous or bad for my, for my cooking. There's this one day I thought, you know what, I deserve it. I'm going to cook myself a great meal. So I took out my box of craft dinner and I, and I started making it. And, I, and this was, I'll be honest, this was like when I first time I was making craft dinner because like I'm usually more sophisticated. I'm joking. Okay, like the craft dinner is like my one thing I can do really good. And so I make it and I make it as best as I can and I taste it. And then I had this thought of when I was a kid, my dad used to always add salt to craft dinner and I never understood why. Like I was like, like why are you doing the salt and pepper? And so I did that one day and, and it was the best craft dinner I've ever had in my entire life. It absolutely changed my life, this meal that I had prepared for myself. Salt is powerful. But salt can also do nothing. And so we have to learn how do we actually become the salt of the world. And I realized when I was cooking that the influence that salt can have on something, right? As simple as craft dinner, the, the impact it can have on an organization or the impact that's being salted, enhancing something, bringing out the good in other people, what that can do is so powerful. I don't know if you know somebody who just walks in the room and all of a sudden you just feel better. The person that, that when you walk in the room, you might be having a, ha- a hard day, they can sit beside you and encourage you and, and sit with you and be there for you in your hardest moments. You just feel better around them. They can enhance your mood. They can bring the best out of you. I believe that really what Jesus is saying is go into the world and bring me and make the world better. Make the world better. Actually impact the world. Actually make people, pull people out of the pit and bring them into the place I've called them to be. Be a part of changing the world. He's telling us to take action on our drifting culture. Not just let things happen, but step in and bring Jesus back into the picture. we got to engage with what is happening. I think the question we have to ask is what influence am I having on the people around me? What influence do I have on my children? What influence do I have on my coworkers? And what influence do I have on my boss? And what influence do I have on my spouse? And I think sometimes you look at the influence we're having and we're like, "Ah, when I walk in the room, my kids aren't as joyful as I wish they were. When I walk into work, my... People sometimes just walk past me because they know I'm going to be grumpy today. 
It's Monday morning, I'm tired. What influence do you have? Have you lost your saltiness? Have you lost your calling? Have you lost the things God has called you to do and the things he's called you to be in the world? Have you lost your ability to enhance the environments that you find yourself in? Are you using your God-given talents and your God-given abilities to make people better and to show people Jesus? Now, sometimes when we are doing that, it can be a scary place to be. It can be scary for some of us when we think, I don't, should I speak up? Should I, should I actually say something? Should I actually go and pray with this person? I'm feeling I'm supposed to, but I don't know if I should. Should I encourage them? It might be awkward. I don't know, even know their name. It can be kind of scary sometimes. But he says, you are the salt of the earth. We are supposed to be the ones who go and bring the gospel. We're supposed to be the ones who influence culture. We're supposed to be the ones who influence art and music. We're supposed to be the ones. You are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything. It can have to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. And I've gone to this place so many times in my life where I'm looking at the influence I'm having. And I'm not very happy with the influence I'm having on people around me. And maybe you've been through moments like this too. Have you ever noticed that sometimes your mood directly um, is the same as your kid's mood? And I often think, is it because of me or is it because of them? You know what I'm talking about? Like, is my kid having a bad attitude because I'm having a bad attitude? Most of the time for me, the answer is y yes. We have power to influence people. And it might be as small as, as walking through the door and putting all the stress from work away and actually having a moment to engage with your child. To actually have a conversation with your spouse. You know, and I talk about this a lot, but I think that our cell phones are ruining our relationship. Like ruining them. And I'm seeing this in, in Beth and I's relationship too. I, I can't tell you how many times the kids are in bed and we're just literally sitting on the couch six feet away, scrolling on our phones. We're not even having a conversation. How many time, how many hours I'm wasting. And then we wonder why our kids want to have their iPads all the time. We're like, you got to be careful with your screen time. Yet our screen time, some days my screen time is like eight hours a day. And I don't really like sometimes when I look at the app on my phone that's like, you were on Facebook today, three hours. I'm like, whoa, that's a waste of time. And so what we've done is we've, 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 given, up, we've given up our influence by getting so distracted. We're getting so distracted by everything that's around us. We sometimes we feel our influence is slipping and we're leading people maybe even in the wrong direction. And those moments, I often have to look to myself too and be who and what am I surrounding myself with? Why is it that my, my mood is so horrible? Is it because I've been on my phone or whatever so long today that my mood is so bad? It says 1 Corinthians 15, 33 says this, do not be deceived, bad company ruins good morals. So what, what and who you're in the, in the company of can, will really affect everything you believe. And so we see this through technology, that, that it's, it's, we're in the company of so much technology that it, it's changing our brains, that our attention spans are so small now. And we find ourselves in this place quite often. We're surrounded ourselves with people and things that don't push us towards Jesus. They don't push us towards the right things they don't push us towards good morals. They're actually pulling us back and tearing away the most intimate of relationships and the most intimate of conversations. I want to encourage all of us, those of us who maybe we feel, yeah, my saltiness is, is not so salty anymore. It might be time to take a deep look at what you're doing with your time. Who are you spending your time with? What are you spending your time doing and if we want to become salty again, there's only one way, and it's to spend time in the intimate presence of Jesus. To actually spend time with our creator. 
with spending time with God and, and, and growing with him, that's how we can become salty again. You know, another reason why sometimes we lose our salt in this is because the weight of the world and the stresses of the world are just so heavy. We feel like we don't have time. We don't have the energy. And I think sometimes I find it so interesting. You know, again, we sang about it earlier, we can find joy in every battle. And that's a tough thing for us to do, the hardest moments. But I think sometimes those moments are really what actually make us more salty as well if we cling on to God. Because you know if, we, if you have a, a pot of, of, of salt water and you boil it, what's left is just the salt. It becomes a very high concentration of salt. So sometimes when we go through hard moments and we feel like the, the fire is burning around us, we feel like we're walking into the water alone, God might be shaping us and refining us through those moments. Again, he might not cause them, but he can use them to help us grow and actually help us have a story and help us have the things to share to be help be salty again in the world. Sometimes the hardest moments we go through are the things that define us. They refine us and then they, they define us. And so we can actually step into the future knowing that God is going with us. I want to encourage all of you and all of us to be intentional about what we're bringing into the world, what we're bringing home, what we're bringing to our kids, what we're bringing to work, what we're bringing to church, that we can be the salt of the world just like God has called us to be. God has chosen you and I to take care of his most precious creation, and that's one another. His most precious creation is you and I, and God has chosen you and me to actually be a part of Loving and bringing salt back into the world, actually enhancing the world and bringing life back where dead things are. We have to find ways to love and value people. You know, if each and every one of us in this room every day were to just wake up and say, God, how do I add value to somebody today? How do I, how do I help somebody today? Imagine how many lives could be changed if we just were willing to add value, not just take value. One thing I've started doing in my life is the end of each day is think about who I added value to that day. I find out, I try to ask myself each day, am I, am I actually bringing impact? Am I actually influencing in the right way today? And it doesn't have to be complicated. It doesn't have to be expensive. It might be just literally as simple as opening a door for somebody. Even if they're far away and it's kind of awkward. You know that space where the door, you're like, am I just going to open it? And then you wait a little long and then you close it and it's like they're like right when it sh you should have held it. You know what I'm talking about? It's the most awkward moment. And I, I don't like those moments. So sometimes now I just sit there and wait and smile and it's like, this is really weird. But then they walk in and then they open the door for me and I say thank you and then I open it for them and they say thank you. That's my favorite moment actually. Because it's the most like grateful people are sometimes in culture is when we open doors for each other. You know, it might be when you're driving and rush hour on yellowhead or white mud, letting somebody in and smiling while you do it. Okay, I'm telling you, when somebody lets me in, I'm so grateful. But when somebody doesn't let me in, I'm not grateful at all. Right? You know what I'm talking about? I think the most frustrating thing for us as humans is when we don't get our way. Even if we think we have the right of way. You know what I'm talking about? You know, it might be buying a coffee for somebody at work. You might be giving somebody a hug who you know really needs it. It might be calling the person that you've had on your mind for months that you're too scared to call because it's been so long. Just give them a phone call. It might be just giving your child the attention that they need. It might be just spending time with people. It might just, I don't know, but how can we add value to people every single day? How can we bring salt back in the world? We're supposed to be the people of influence. We gotta be intentional about it. And then the next thought we have is this, is that we need to be the light. See, salt is about influence. But I believe light is more about presence than it is about influence. Because our world is dark. Some of our workplaces are dark. Some of our homes might be dark. But when you're in the room, it's not supposed to be dark. When you're in the room, it's supposed to be different. It says, you are the light of the world. In verse 14, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. 
nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket. But on a stand as it gives light to all the house. The one thought I've been thinking about, I find it so funny, is our lamps right now are literally lights we put in a basket. You notice that? And they made them kind of see-through. I just find that funny. Like, I'm not, like, there's, like, literally no point to that. I'm just like, wow, we literally get lights and then we put baskets on them to make them less light. Anyway, there's my thoughts. I don't know if you've ever experienced being in a very dark space. And I don't mean, like, dark in the sense of, like, the lights are all off. I know sometimes, this is a true story, when I was in Calgary as a youth pastor, I'd my, one of my roles every Wednesday night after youth was to lock the building. And a basement is very dark when the lights are off, right? And so I'd be walking and be like, Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble. As I'm like walking through the dark basement. I'm, I'm, I'm not joking. Not that I was like scared, but like, there's like this part of me that's like, I don't like the darkness. You know, when we're in the room, it's supposed to be light. And, and I'm talking about not just pitch black dark, because I'm talking about when you walk into a space and spiritually it feels dark. One of the darkest spaces I have ever been in my life spiritually was when we were in, we were in Thailand and we were in Phuket and we were in this red light district. Red light district really is where um, you'll see uh, men and women and children being sold um, for, uh, into sex slavery. And this is right now when culture is becoming really common. There's a movie that just came out kind of talking about some of this. And we were, me and my team, there's maybe 10 of us. We were just walking through um, this red light district as we're seeing people being purchased and sold all around us. And what was fascinating to me was that the people buying these people, some of them were young. Some of them were my age. I, was, I think I was 20. Some of them were my age. Some of them were older. Some of them were younger. Purchasing people. And I remember standing there, and it's this overwhelming sense. If you've ever experienced darkness like this, it's this overwhelming sense that tries to come upon you of hopelessness. I don't know if you've ever felt that way. Where the situation or the moment or the place is so dark, and you're like... You just kind of feel like, is it possible? Like those thoughts kind of try and come in. This is the darkest place I, I ever found myself in. And we were seeing people, we were seeing people dancing in windows. And one night we were walking and they, we just were getting like shut down. Like we were trying to go and pray for people. We'd, you know, I'd go sit at like one of the bars and I'd try to have a conversation with one of these people about to be, you know, purchase somebody. They're called John's. I'd go and. We're just getting shut down. We try and hand out roses and just like nothing was happening. It was like, God, like, like what do we do? We didn't know what to do, right? Like, we're like, what, what do you do in the darkest place you've ever found yourself? And one of the, and this is the beautiful part is that in the middle of the dark and honestly, one of the gross, most disgusting places I've ever found myself. We, we huddled as a team, almost like you see like a team do, like at a football team, like huddle. We get as a team and we're just like linked arms. We start, start praying. Because, like, when it's that dark, what do you do? Invite Jesus into it? We're supposed to be the light. And so we start praying and praying. And we started just to feel this, this shift happening. The shift happening. In, and I don't know if it was the environment, if it was us that was becoming, that was shifting. I think sometimes prayer doesn't shift the situation. It shifts our hearts. And so we're sitting there, we're fired up, we're praying and praying and praying. And then we stop praying and we start going and the door started to be opened and we were able to have great conversations and pray with some of these people. We have to take the basket off and let our light shine. Matthew 28, 19, verse 20, uh, 19 to 20. This is the great, the great Commission. This is what it says, go, therefore. And make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all I have the command all I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. He's telling us here that our job is not to sit and wait. Our job is to go. Some of us were like, Yeah, I don't ever see darkness. It's because you're not trying to bring light into the darkness. You're only finding places where other light is and you're going there. I think sometimes in our culture, especially as believers, and I get so caught up in this, we get in these bubbles where it's so bright in the room we can barely see, but then two blocks away, there's no light. 
Our job, yes, come together, get filled up, and then go into the world and bring light to the darkest places. That's what we're supposed to do. We can't just sit at home and, or sit at church and sit at work and be like, God, I'm waiting for the assignment. He's just like, go. Go. Go into all the world, all nations. Make disciples. I think some of us were so good at waiting for the darkness. We prepared for it. And we're waiting for it to come. But we're just waiting. And we're waiting. And we're waiting and the darkness isn't coming. We're like, God, I'm ready. Where's the darkness? He's like, all around you. Just get up and go. You know, John 12, verse 46 says this, I have come, this is Jesus, I have come into the world as light so that whoever believes in me may not, may not remain in darkness. He's the light of the world. So what are we? We're reflections of his light. When we walk into a dark place, when we walk into a dark room, we walk into this place where people don't know Jesus the way we act, the way we present ourselves, again, it's not about really what we say. It's about our presence in the moment. The way we act, the way we present ourselves matters when we go. Because the reality is, as unfortunate as it is, there's a lot of people in our world who are so just turned off to the church and turned off to Jesus. A lot of people have been so hurt by, by the church and hurt by believers. And, and it just breaks my heart when I hear stories of people who have been just so hurt by the church. And, and whether or not, I'm not saying that it's even fully the church's fault or the leader's fault. the way we present ourselves matters the way I like to think of it is again like it's a reflection we're supposed to reflect what we see Jesus doing I saw this image and it really reminded me of this it's this image I can pull it up of, of this lion and if you see the reflection is a lot bigger and scarier than the actual lion the first one's kind of cute and cuddly right I'd probably try and pet it, you know? I picture us. That's how I see me sometimes, right? Small, insignificant, timid, vulnerable. In a lot of ways, sometimes we feel so inadequate. We're like, yeah, God, you want me to be the salt and the light? Like, I can barely put my shoes on right sometimes. But when we see the reflection, we see him. We see his love and we see his peace and we see his joy. So we come small, we sometimes come timid and we say, God, use me. And then what we are supposed to present to the world is this beautiful image of Jesus' love for them. This is what happens when we fill ourselves with Jesus. When we spend our time with him, the more we become like him. The more we love like him and the, the more we have grace like him and the more we have peace like him and the more we bring light like him. As we walk in his image, as we reflect what we see him doing, he says, I only do what I see the Father doing. Because we want people to see Jesus when we walk in a room. But the question is what happens when we cut ourselves off from the source? What happens? What are we reflecting? Nothing. Reflecting our, we're reflecting our own selves. And sometimes the reflection we see when we look in the mirror is not what we wish we were presenting. How are we supposed to bring light into the world if we stop spending time with the source? What if we're surrounding ourselves with things or people that we shouldn't be? What are we reflecting then the question we have to ask is what am I reflecting now? Because reality is that you will always reflect what you spend the majority of your time doing. You'll always reflect 
The people you spend the most time with, that's what you'll become like. We have to think about it. How do I spend my time? Who, who do I spend my time with? Because most likely that's what we're reflecting as well. Are we doing the things that, and spending the time doing the things that are allowing us to reflect God's light and asking us to, to bring his light? I want to encourage all of us, maybe you've been, your time with Jesus has kind of started to not happen so often. Summertime, I'm busy. I'm fishing. I ain't got time for that, you know. Make time. You want to be a good father? Spend time with God? You want to be a good boss? Read the Bible? You want to be a good friend? Look how Jesus treated his friends. I guarantee you, when we spend more time with Jesus, we will have greater influence. And darkness will tremble when we walk in the room, not because of my presence, but because of his presence. I wrote a poem written by M.S. Lowndes. It's called God's Light. It says this, Lord, you are the light that this world desperately needs. Let our lamps keep burning bright so the lost may come to see. The light of your love burning brightly in our hearts, chasing away the darkness, revealing who you are. So your glory may be seen in everything we do. In our everyday happenings, may, we, may our lives acknowledge you. No matter where you send us, whatever we, land we're in, may your light pierce through the darkness penetrating deep within to stir up deep desire to truly seek your face and come fully into your light and receive your saving grace. The more we're like him, the more impact and the more light we carry. I think we're becoming, as culture, so maybe it's timid and we're, we're afraid of judgment. We're afraid of being ignored. We're, so what we're starting to see is we're starting to see lights go out in churches and people beginning to hide their light. And the church starting to kind of grow dim. And again, I believe this with all my heart that God is calling the church to be a city on a hill that cannot be hidden. Of influence and impact and light. The way we will see this happen is when the church, believers, and followers of Jesus come together and let our lights shine brightly together and let our salt flow. I believe that God is calling us, Known Victory Church, to be a beacon in our community, a beacon in this business park, a beacon in West Edmonton where the light is. It's radiating and reflecting the light into this city. And I believe that starts, again, with all of us committing to letting our light shine brightly. No matter the rejection, which is so tough, no matter the judgment, we say, I'm going to let my light shine brightly before others. It's time for us to go into the world, not just sit back and wait, but to go bring the light wherever we go. You know, I think that the fear of losing our saltiness and the fear of losing our light should outsign our fear of not actually living it out. But it's not just be people that say we love, but we actually got to be people who actually do love. And our takeaway today is going to blow your mind. I'm called to be the, the salt and light of the world. <laughs> Mind's blown, right? What an original thought. <laughs> but it's true. Like, it, it's not, it doesn't have to be complicated. Let's go be the salt. Wherever we go, let's impact. Let's bring influence. Let's bring Jesus. And let's, 
Let's be people who carry light so the darkness trembles when we walk in a room. Let's pray. Father, I thank you. First of all, that you are the author of all things. We thank you that you are our provider when it comes to light. You're our provider when it comes to salt. So God, if we're feeling diminished, if we're feeling tired, if we're feeling weary, help us not be so prideful, not be so proud to actually say, God, I need you. Help us be humble. Help us realize our desperate need for you every single day. Help us stop getting so busy with meaningless things that our relationship with you is starting to dwindle. Help us make you a priority in our life. That our light will shine, that our salt will go, that our impact and influence will actually bring people closer to you. And help our church, Known Victory Church, help us be a light in this city, a lighthouse that is bringing ships home, bringing people home. Help us shine our light. In Jesus' name, amen.